Yeah, all right. James just used his teeth to open up a bottle. <laughs> no, I didn't. Because, hey, a crown, what are they, like a G? Whatever. I'm pretty sure I have, like, I have, I'm in need of multiple root canals at this point as far as my we are, I, I just got a Dremel, and it has the 90-degree Oh, uh, we can do that. Tool. We'll do that later. So let's do Right it. after the podcast. You're listening to the Bent Motorsports Podcast with the owner of Bent Motorsports, David Beckett. So we're in it. We're, we're be, talking. We're, we're podcasting talking right now. Restoring cars. Okay, well, have you ever restored a car? Uh, okay, everybody at the table who's restored a car, raise your hand. I guess. I guess. No, yeah. and I guess is not. No. <laughs> okay, well, what, it depends what you consider restoration because I Have you did... restored a bike? Have you restored a bike? All right, speed? hang on, hang on. All right, let's start over. Has anybody ever done a frame-off restoration? Okay, It was David. a unibody, so fuck you. <laughs> nope, nope. See, like, nope. I've, I've restored a unibody car where I rebuilt every bit of the suspension. I did the interior. I changed it from tan to red. What I, I consider to be a restoration, in my opinion, is every single nut, bolt, and wire that can be part that can be taken apart and dismantled. Has it's it. taken apart and dismantled and either repaired or replaced. I I've never done that. I, I don't re- believe it. I that to my- me is a restoration of a car. You can't just slap a paint on it, put new suspension on it, and put some gauges in it and new upholstery and go, yeah, man, I restored it. No. All right, well, fuck you. Then. You gave we'll it a we'll facelift, leave, and then you can just do this on your you own. You gave it a facelift, <laughs> but you didn't. You know what I mean? You no, there's, okay, there is a difference. If all the shit under the straight, dash is old and dirty, then the nut and bolt restoration and like a serious makeover. Because so this is a good way to start this podcast. Have, you ever, into the have you ever made of what a bad is. decision and decided that you were going to invest a lot of money into a car that looked like a piece of crap? Yes. Every yeah. day. Every day. Every huh? day. Oh Every my day. gosh. Every car I've ever owned. Every- <laughs> I'm trying to sell these BMWs right now, and if somebody wants to trade me like you know a sixty. Eight galaxy, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> and, a dr- and a dry H. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, sick. And then you'll become the resident expert on a sixty-eight galaxy because you immediately go on Wikipedia and figure out everything that it ever had or could have had. That's literally my personality <laughs> type. That's the truth to a T, and I love it every Ooh, time. Wow. I know all the acronyms for this car, bad. so just sit back and listen. Okay, so David knows more than all. I'm not, three and of I'm us. not trying to say I know more. I'm just trying to get a feel for where we're at on I'll, this conversation. I'll say you know more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not trying to say that I know more, but you're not very smart when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> hey, I, like I've said a million times, they might, I may not always be right, but I'm never wrong. Just so you know. Fair enough. So, so you're. So what? Take that, that however frame you need off, to take I won't, Frame I won't off restoration. What car was it? Uh, we did a frame off on a uh, '69 Scout. That was a resto a. mod. It was a resto mod? Yeah. I'm just saying. That's pretty cool. So cool Resto, if you don't understand what Resto stands for, it stands for Restoration Mod Modification. So it was a modified restoration. Still it's restoration. So, you had like four link front and rear, coilovers front and rear. Really nice truck, actually. I saw a couple pictures of it, and yeah. it was badass. I remember you guys showed me that one. That thing was freaking sweet. Did an El Camino. What's your favorite one that you've done? You've restored like countless triumphs now, huh? Countless triumphs. Um... I only really did one full restoration on one Triumph. Um, let's see what else. the The Scout Eight Hundred was was pretty sweet. That was a fun one. The I I really liked the El Camino. The El Camino was uh, um, we put a crate engine, a four fifty four crate engine in it. Um, and we we seven hundred and fifty horsepower one that they come out with. That one's sweet. It was the carbureted one. It was the carbureted 454 from GM Performance. That, that was, was sweet. It was a rad engine, yeah. and and they wanted it so that the hood, that was my boss at the time, and he wanted it so that it didn't look like it had a 454 in it because everybody puts the big, giant cowl induction hoods on them in order yeah. to put this big, huge engine in there. America. Yeah, we had, since it was a frame off, we just basically cut and remade the entire front frame so that the engine would sit all the way down in super low. That's my style. I like that. Way that way the stock hood fits on it, and you don't even know there's a 454 in there. So where do rad. you – okay, so wait, what what condition was the Scout in when you guys got it? It was uh, rusty all the way through. It needed a ton and ton and ton of uh, sheet metal work. So where do you start? Do you just start doing the sheet metal work? Do you take yeah. the whole cab off first, like yeah, rotisserie so, that thing and just – Yeah, pretty much. I mean, what we, what we do is – chicken. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah, Wait until someone it's... said rotisserie, so I was like Chicken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. <laughs> right? All right, sorry. Go so on. like you guys, you've looked at cars, so you you've done your own form of a restoration on cars. You get a car and you look at it and you think, Oh, I want to uh I want to make this car look pretty. I'll pull the engine. And then if it's a unibody, it's a unibody, whatever. There's no frame. So there's no question of do I got to take the frame off? But say, do you do you get to the... Don't worry. It's already rusted out. So yeah, you, you're, you're screwed. You guys, you've done it. So you look at this car and you're thinking, I'm going to fix this car up. Well, where do you draw the line? Where do you stop fixing it up? You yeah, look at don't. the engine compartment and you go, okay, I'm going to do this. And then the firewall. But then you start looking down the transmission tunnel oh. and you're like... Well, where do I stop scrubbing? Mm-hmm. Where do I stop degreasing? Where do I yeah. stop and go, well, from here forward, it's going to be new paint. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Am I right? going to scrape the 20 pounds of undercoating off the bottom and, you know, right. try to get yeah. that done? So but then there's also, when you look at these cars, and <clears throat> it wasn't a car that I did this on, but I went, uh, you know, I went for visual before I went for actual mechanical, uh, I guess, integrity, whatever you would call it. I... I had a DR650, a 94, and I was like, all right, sweet. Took everything apart, uh, had the frame sandblasted, powder-coated, like took all the tabs off, re-welded what tabs needed to be wel- like put on there, took the ones off that weren't necessary, got new plastics, new tank or whatever, because it ran once, so I was like, it's fine, it's fine. Got it all put back together, started it, a little bit of a tick, so I was like, all right, well, I probably just need to do some valve adjustment. Cam was just done cam was chewing into the head they don't make the head anymore like i bought it because it had more horsepower than new the newer drs did and yeah. you got to look at these things first like is this something that i'm gonna dump a bunch of money into that actually yes. runs like crap right <laughs> well yeah and, the, and the, so i've also had a lot of people come to me and say yeah dave i want to restore this car and the 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 reality of it is is that a good restoration. I'm not even saying the best restoration. This is not a concourse restoration, but a good restoration is a thousand hours. And a shop rate is 100, 115, 125 an hour. That's a lot of money. <laughs> so this is why guys restore cars in their garage over the period of 10 or 15 years yeah. is because it's the labor that is so expensive. So, or well, you see guys lose their ass at Meekum. When, well, yeah. Oh, I'll yeah, tell people all the time. Hey, they go can't to get, you know, make him get a seventy thousand dollars <laughs> for something, which is a pretty penny for a car. You can get Camaros for like seventeen thousand bucks. Oh yeah, yeah. Are cherry too. Oh yeah. yeah, like at that, they are cherry. I, I, mean, I advise spent a lot of money on that at one point. I advise everybody who comes to me about a vehicle restoration, and I say first go to Meekum, go to Barrett Jackson, go to auctions, and try to find that car that you want to restore. Find your dream car, and if you can find it, and it's the wrong color. Either live with the new color or paint it yeah. or put different wheels and tires on it. Yep. But if, if it's just you're absolutely in love with this specific car and you've maybe had it in your family it's your whole life and there's some sentimental value, it was your dad's car, and you want to spend the money, then go for it. Spend the money. Um, but it is it is very expensive to do a proper restoration on a car. Yeah. I got a bit, I got a bit of a story for that, too, is my, uh, my uncle, he wanted a 66 Chevelle. He had one when he was in high school. Uh, he loved that car, so there he was. He was on the hunt to go find one. And so he found one that was in Kansas, and I guess we have a cousin that was out there, so they looked at the car. Apparently that person wasn't very wise, and they were like, yeah, dude, this thing looks good. Like, it's ready to go. So my uncle and my cousin flew all the way out to Kansas uh, with my little cousin who was like got sick that morning, and he was throwing up the whole plane right out there. They were supposed to drive the car back from Kansas to L.A., and they got there, and there was like, there was like house speakers that were not even bolted down. They were just sitting under the seat, and that was like the sound system. The wiring was like way chewed up, and they ended up just saying, "Nope, we're not doing it." They scratched that whole idea, flew back home, and that was it, you know. Yeah. And sure enough, he waited out, and he got a really clean one that was in the same town that they live in, you know. So that's, I think that's one of the big things is is wait around, don't don't jump on the first thing. And you really got to be weary of cars that aren't from like. Arizona, New Mexico, yes. you know, these places. Oh, yeah. Southwest e- cars are the Even best. the beach. Think about the beach. We've had people come in here with, like, uh, <laughs> you just look at radiators, frames, and stuff for people that just live within a couple miles of the beach. It's corrosive. 
All that yeah. stuff will destroy frames. Like, you could literally touch the radiator and all the fins just fall out. And you're like, uh, well, well, what yeah, does the have, rest of the car look like? We you have know? customers that have hot rods that we've built and worked on, and they live by the beach. And they come in once a year for annual work and routine stuff. And we're like, holy crap, everything needs to be what re-chromed. Happened? Yeah. Take all the chrome off and get it all re-chromed. So the whole bottom of the truck in WD-40, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. When the Coug brought in his uh, his uh, Oh, my Nissan. God. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Just I mean, okay. So the Pacific Northwest, depending on where you live, could not be that bad. Like it's not going to rust through a frame in some places, but yeah. surface rust, yeah, can like we had to cut the lower control arms off. It was a this yeah. truck was maybe five years old. These are like all things you have to think about. Like get under your car right now, like any southwestern car, and take a lower control arm off. You kind of know what you're in for. We spent four hours at least trying to get one on a 30 off. minute drive yeah we're spoiled over here imagine being like a uh, a regular automotive shop mechanic oh, in man. like a Indiana. wisconsin or something <laughs> oh, my gosh. Gotta literally like oh, double the time that's off to you guys you guys are stuck yeah you yeah. are you gotta double the time at least for just an average repair you know like somebody does need a lower control arm think and about it when is what an hour for that procedure to be done but realistically if you're over there and it it's rusted out. That could be a three-hour job, and you are not ready for that. And they don't want to pay that, no, you know. No. And no, I don't know. Think about back when they salted all the roads, like when salt was a common thing. Because you know they kind of no. do sand now, and they'll do. I, I guess they some places. Some salt. Yeah, but think about when they were just dumping it in, not thinking about like the whole environmental movement, whatever. Yeah, <sighs> environment. I got this sweet wagoneer. It's awesome, isn't it? Mm, just taking a screwdriver, poking holes through the frame. It's yeah. fine. Yeah, and to go back a little bit uh, to that El Camino, and we're talking about, like, where do you draw the line? I'm My personality is not that I can just stop. <laughs> like, I can't just, like, scrub half the frame, but if I can't get to, like, the top of the frame where the frame and the floor meet, like, if I can't get up in there and scrub it and clean it and paint it, I'm like, oh, body's got to come off. <laughs> so my boss was like, no, Dave, we're going we're gonna to squeeze a 454 in it, and we're going to shoot a coat of paint on it, and I'm going to be hot rodding down the road. And he comes down one day because I was in the engine compartment trying to clean and get the engine compartment ready for the engine. Mm. And so I took the body off. And then I got a rotisserie and I put the body on a rotisserie. And he comes down. And he's like, what the hell happened? I'm like, well, I couldn't get to the spot to clean. So I had to take it apart. <laughs> he's like, you took the whole body off the frame. I'm like, yeah, so that's not a big deal, right? And since it's off, I might as well just have the frame powder coated, right? Because we're going to do It's easier all... way to do it. Because yeah. I'm going to cut all this stuff on the frame and then re-weld it and modify it. And then we're just going to, what, rattle can it? That's going to look mm-hmm. dumb. <laughs> so next thing you know, we're having the entire body sandblasted down to bare metal which was a good thing because we found in the back window frames that somebody had bondoed over uh some rust and then put a new window in and then it just started chewing from there yeah so when you pop the chrome off and pull the glass out and then you chip all the the bondo off there was basically no no window sill in the back bondo is a hell of a drug so we had to cut all that (laughs) basically had to cut all that out all new stuff back there wow Um, but yeah, there's a there's a like don't you know if you're getting a car and you get all excited and you go get your seats upholstered, you know don't do that until you're you're done. Yeah, you know? like the upholstery comes like at the end because otherwise now you've got an upholstered seat that you got to put in like a trash bag and hide in a rafter somewhere, and then a year later you finally get to the point where you're going to put the seats in and the rats have chewed through the brand new upholstery. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know rad. so. The There's kind too, of an order with, with paint too, because paint's one of those things you do absolutely last. In Plus, my what if you just accidentally ding it, like I yeah. did today to the Spitfire? You know? Yeah. Thanks, and Jake. I You're welcome. Be, you know, I would be pissed. My car has been resprayed like twice, so it's not to the point where I'm like, it's original paint. I got to keep it nice. You know? It's like it's resprayed. Yeah. BMW. Yeah. 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 It's been resprayed twice. But there's only certain parts of it, or has yeah, the whole thing parts, been like done once? And the then... hood and the trunk have not been done, to my recollection. Got it. But, but it's hardly vendors... noticeable except in the right yeah, light. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's like a, I'd say it's like almost a two foot paint job. Like when I say that, when you say it's a ten foot paint job, that means it's pretty bad. When you say it's a thirty foot paint job, that's even worse. When you say it's like fifty fifty, a, a like magnifying 50 glass, feet, fifty miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that looked really cool. So, I mean, when you there's a lot of people out there that that you have a car that's probably a ten. 10 foot paint job you know but yeah i mean i got kind of lucky uh it actually took me like a few a few days to realize that thing was that thing was resprayed because it somebody did take the time to do it right at one point so i didn't notice cool. on the forerunner that it had yeah. been resprayed but it then i was like there's some orange peel on here and then you brought it up you're like it's been resprayed and i was like 
Why does somebody have to say that? <laughs> but it wasn't terrible. It was peeling anyways. Whatever. I've taken photos of your car in a lot of different lights, and I've never would It's hard to tell. There's I no, wouldn't. like, discoloration or anything. You know, you have I to really get up close to There's it. just that one part where if it's in the sun, you can tell there's a crinkle in the fender somehow. Yeah. And that you're like, oh, I, I think that's been repainted. Yeah. But otherwise, you can't even see it. Right. I think probably the biggest right. mistake I see people make in restoring cars is that they don't realize that you have to completely build the entire car twice. Yeah. To do it right, you have to completely build the entire car, fab every door, put every door jam on, check every panel, like build the whole car. Yeah. I would even say to the point where I would almost wire the entire car and turn it on sometimes even. Yeah. And go, okay, that's it. It's all built. It's it's this is exactly how it has to be. Okay, tear it all down. Paint, paint it, everything. You know? Let's do it right. Now do time. all the finish work, right? Tear yeah. everything down, paint it, powder coat it, chrome it, whatever that phase of it is, and then rebuild the whole car one more time for final assembly. Yeah. And a lot of people don't get that. They're trying to do things out of order and it there's now pretty... you got a painted car and the door doesn't shut, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then there's paint chipped off. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a drag. But that's the order. That's the right order and uh, you know, it's expensive to do it that way. But it's the right way to do it. Yeah. Plus, it's like a lift kit. It's like uh, any aftermarket part that you're going to install, no car is the same. I don't care who you ask. You go to a car and you try to install something, whether it's a thousandth of an inch or, like, a lot. You don't know how the car's been driven before. The frame might be bent. Everything fits a little bit differently. So, yeah. you know, you, you're not going to go through the same process that somebody else went through restoring their car. Right. Yeah, it's... It's a whole different game. Every car is different. Every time it's different. I think the hardest one I ever did wasn't truly a restoration. was that Jensen Interceptor that had been smashed into a wall. That sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, they come with the Dodge. They come with Mopars. That's a 318, right? Yeah, this one had a – I think this one was the 318. I think I only worked on one Jensen that was the 440 uh, engine, but they all had the 727 uh, transmission. Weren't those garbage? The transmissions? Yeah. No, the 727s are good. I oh. Don't, I, don't, I don't think they're bad transmissions. But this car had been smashed into a wall, and these the, the British cars and the Jensen's especially were all hand-built. So every single car was different. And we had donor cars and spare parts, and you'd have one car right next to the next car, and one car was like an inch and a half longer than the other car. <laughs> and a door would be two inches different than the door on the car next to it because Whoa. everything was handmade. So bizarre to think about, though. And Imagine then it was all, that. like, lead sweated in, you know, all the yep. seams. It was one continuous, you know, the inner fenders, outer fenders, unit frame, everything. is The only thing you can take off of a Jensen Interceptor is the hood, the rear hatch, and the doors. And the doors, you can get them off, but they're not meant to come off. And everything else is one giant monocoque piece. Gnarly. Jake's smiling because he doesn't like when I use that word. <laughs> Mono? I'm a child. Mono? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's <laughs> hilarious. That's the one. So what What did you do? What do people got to do if they crash their car into a wall and they want to restore it? Especially a Jensen. Especially a If it's a Jensen Interceptor, Jensen. I can do it, but bring a whole bunch of money. We basically cut the front end off of another car right at the A-pillar and then grafted it on to this other car. We cut the front of one off and cut the front of the other off and then grafted it on. And then we even used the lead solder and sweat it all back together and everything just like Jesus they did Christ. back then filed it all down and we just basically did exactly what they would have done if they were building the car yeah and it looked great in the end you couldn't tell it was it was fixed that is crazy it was fun it was a good project was it, it worth a, it for, well, them? for me it was because it was well yeah it was worth it for them a guy ended up buying it off of ebay from over in england and the car got shipped over to england a uh, guy who was a member of the Jensen Club in in London or something. Do you oh, admit that to other people that you're a Club. you're a member of the Jensen Club? Because I don't know if I would admit no, that. No, I didn't. I'm not a member. You you're not. No. But, yeah, but do you think he did? Because that's not really something that dude, I would be. He was proud of it. That's well, weird. he's from England. Oh, see, dude, that he, is what, a cult culture for sure. Dude, what he wanted over <laughs> there was he wanted it just like over here. Like I see guys all the time over here buying right hand drive skylines because they think they're badass, right? Because oh, it's right hand drive, bro. Wow. I got to have it. Whereas everybody in Japan's going, dude, bro, all the cars are right-hand drive. What are you, stupid? Yeah. <laughs> so this Jensen made vehicles for all over the world. So the ones that came to the U.S. were, were left-hand drive yeah. because they were for the U.S. Well, a Jensen guy in London wants a Jensen. He wants a left-hand drive one from the United States because all of his buddies in the club have right-hand drive ones. 
So he has the only left-hand drive Jensen interceptor. Wow. So he was all stoked. He paid a grip of money for it. That's like the old 5 Series that I have. Everyone in the States wants the Euro grills because they're like real big outside lights and then real small high beams. Right. And I put my U.S. spec lights, which are just small, small, and I put those up on eBay or Craigslist, and literally some dude from Finland was like, dude, I got to have these things. He goes, you can't get those over here. It's like, dude, come over here and get like 80 sets of them, you know? But the Euro the Euro grills here go for anywhere from 250 bucks to 700 bucks just for the lights and the grills. So for that guy to get a set, I'm sure it's the same way over there. You could probably pick up that same thing for 40 bucks, you know? Yeah, so now is always greener. you're in the realm of you're going to restore a car. How are you going to restore it? What parts are broken? What parts can you fix? How much is it going to cost? Like, it gets wild. It, it gets, gets wild, dude. It's just like, I can't even... Such a snowball. It is. Dude, if I you guys want to go even crazier, I, I, I wish I could remember the name of the shop in Escondido. Um, when I was looking for a job back in 2010, I went over and interviewed at the shop, and I can't remember the name of it. I apologize. Whoever. Hilltop Classics? No, no, wasn't no. that a wasn't that a uh, place? That's like a Ford to... place. Oh, got it. This place was a this place was a Concours restoration shop. So this this place would take like um, an old like 1912 whatever Buick that's been sitting out on a farm for a hundred years basically, and they would bring it back to life, right? But these guys knew it. the Jakes are having a moment right now. Everybody, <laughs> I wish there was a camera. <laughs> one day, I think they're gonna kiss. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> so these guys would take these vehicles that were beyond restoration, in, in our opinion, right? Something where, uh, say the starter isn't even there. Say the car had a starter. There was no starter in this car, right, when they got it to restore it. They would know. They would do the research and look up what Buick would have put in that. And if they are unavailable, they will literally make one. No. And they will make it the way they would. They make a little sand cast, and they would make a mold, and they would – Wow. make components for the starter and they would build a starter the Jesus same way that, that the company who supplied the starter to Buick would have made the starter so that that starter is basically made Damn. exactly the same way. And they had these guys in the back room, these like three old guys Forging who were like 400 <laughs> years old and they're back there like these big swoopy, like Packard fenders, right? The big front fenders that are turned yeah. into running boards. Yeah. They're making them by hand, like Jesus. from scratch. There's like a pile of metal and they're just hammering away out there. And they're hand shaping all these components, and they, those guys, I'm just like, man, I can't work here. You guys are like you're working next your level. Ass you're like, at that point, you're not like a restoration specialist. You're like a historian or something. Yeah, that's what it is. It was like a freaking Smithsonian. It's like somebody restoring the Mona Lisa. You know? Yeah, what I mean? you're, these guys that's were doing crazy. Cre- and so that when I saw that, I'm like, wow, okay, that's some really next level restoration as far as I'm concerned. And there's guys out there. There's there's Mopar guys who know when they're spraying the paint to leave the trunk open because when it went down the assembly line there would be an overspray yep. on this one spot of the trunk and that if you lift up the little mat in the trunk there better be that overspray there or else you didn't restore it right okay here's here's wow what's the point of that I, I, it doesn't it's click just, in my it's just brain just original that's all it is to it's, them but okay when it's not original and it's something like that like the point of recreating it is maybe to the like only useful as far as like being impressed with a forgery might be useful. Right. I'm like, I'm a resto mod guy. I think that with today's technology and today's paints and today's upholsteries and today's rubber and shock tuning and computers, we can make what Dodge would have loved to have made yeah. in 1969. We have the technology. You yeah. know what I mean? We can do this. Oh, that's the truth. And I'm that guy. I don't really give two shits of where the overspray is on a car. Is it is, is it a uh, numbers matching? Yeah. <laughs> is it oh, numbers no. matching? That all, is that you numbers know, matching? You know bro? what we should do? I, what I want to do with my life is purchase every numbers matching like restoration in the world and part it out. <laughs> <laughs> live on live TV. On live TV. It's there just like taking a sledgehammer to like a GT40 from wherever <laughs> it may have come from, you know, and everyone's just like, "What are you doing?" And you're like, Pissing you off. There's there, there is a lot of sentimental and um, um, what do we put? We put something on these cars. We put this personality in these cars and this emotion. 
and I get it. I'm a car guy. I've always been a car guy, but I'm also the first guy to take a four inch hole saw and cut cut right through the side of a fender and <laughs> stick put the a big exhaust old, right through. Put it. a big <laughs> exhaust right out the side. Bingo. Because it's just steel and bolts and paint and metal and plastic. It still runs the same. Still going to get you from A to B yeah. if you get it right. But maybe a little bit faster sometimes. I don't know. But it's it's your car. It's the same reason that these people make these custom cars you, you if you go through your town and you find a style you don't like whether it's a lowered car that somebody took like a brand new escalade and hacked the frame in half and you know they bagged it and put it all the way all the way to the floor to the same guy who takes the ferrari and does some dumb shit with that it's just what they want you know yeah. so who cares what it looks like it's all about you it's all about your taste it's the same reason you can't i'm gonna go put fifty thousand dollars into a car and not get the same out of it because it's my project it's my baby like it's not the same for everyone else. It's like 200 subwoofers yeah. or 2,000 horsepower. It's like <laughs> the list <laughs> you know, goes on. Whatever you want to do, yeah. man. And yeah. I don't know. For me, for me, I think it's cool. Same thing like you said. With how much technology there is now, yeah. it's like, yeah, I could have I could have went and bought an old BMW M3 motor and put it in my car, but it's like, no, do something different. You know, whatever blows your skirt up, and that's what Dave told me actually. Whatever yeah. blows so your skirt up, man. I was going through a quandary of. Yeah, stop, stop building cars for other people. That's a good one that I liked, you know. Just build a car for you. It's your car. Who cares right. what anybody else thinks? Which is that, I don't know if you guys watched Gas Monkey back mm -hmm. in the day, Gas Monkey Garage, Aaron yeah. Kaufman, yeah. right? He's like the master builder on that show. And he finally left the show and started his new show called Shifting Gears. That's what he's doing. He's, he has a new show? Yeah, it's called Shifting it Gears. Rad. It's, it's rad, dude, because he basically said he's been building cars for everybody his whole life, and now he's going to shift gears. He's going to do something else, right? So now, basically, he builds cars for himself, and goes out and does them. Like, he says, I want to do King of the Hammers. So he took a Scout 800 and turned it into a King of the Hammers car and went out and did King of the Hammers. That's rad. That's awesome. And then he went, um, I really like uh, watching diesel trucks race on an oval. I'm going to make a diesel truck and race it. So his shop is all about just making himself vehicles to go out and do things that he's always wanted to do. Does he, like, eventually sell them? Or he just Not so know? far. He's just he's, dude, he's rich now. He's like, do whatever. Oh, this guy's living true. a dream. And now he has a show a about show. doing it. Yeah. Think money. about he, how much gosh, Discovery dang it. paid him over the last, what? That show's been out for half a dozen years now. God, it's been monthly. out for several and years. And so I'm assuming he's got a pretty pretty big chunk of change. Yeah, around, dude, he's but good. With all the with all the endorsements and the sponsors that he's getting, it's like he probably builds these cars for not net zero, but you know, Discovery's yeah, dude, still paying him or Velocity's still playing, paying him to. Dude, he's do on it. Discovery. He, his show's on right after Gas Monkey, so yeah. Gas Monkey Garage is on, and then his show's on. So, no prop, props to him. He's, yeah, he's so he's doing it. it and, and, <laughs> and going back a little bit, you were saying you know whatever blows your skirt up. Think about this too. We were talking about Dodge or Ford or Chevy or whoever making cars. They are making. So if you take a Corvette from 1968, for instance, or whatever, uh, yeah, everybody says, yeah, these engineers, they designed this vehicle. It's perfectly designed. Why would you change it? Well, because they were designing a vehicle to be made on a production line that had to be cost effective to push out like 3,000 or 5,000 cars a year. And have yeah. the right, right? emissions. Yeah. So, know, I mean, let's be clear. They, they were making cars as cheap as they possibly can to make the most possible money because it's a business. It is. Yeah. So every single car out there can be improved. Right, unless you're talking about like a uh, Bugatti Veyron, yeah. Right, then you're just Volkswagen money. made that car and lost millions, and they lose millions every time they sell one because they wanted to say, "Hey, look, this is what a perfect car looks like." In our opinion, we'll yeah. sell them, but we're going to lose our ass on every one of them. It was the same thing with the uh, the NSX. That was supposed to come out what 2012, I think. Right. Oh, they and, didn't predict. Yeah, we keep seeing it in SEMA and their yeah. <laughs> ass on it. Like, they put way more production into it. Those cars are worth, like, two times what they were able to sell them for because they wanted it to be that good. Mm -hmm. and then they Right, and then look what happens. When a car manufacturer makes a perfect car, yeah. it's unsellable. Yep. It's like a perfect product, to be honest. Nobody wants to pay what a perfect product is worth. Exactly. Because nobody understands why, it. Which is why we run into the, uh, finger air quotes, bolt-on problem in yep. here. Because every kit or every bolt-on thing we buy from a manufacturer doesn't really bolt-on. Because if they took all the time it took to really make it bolt on, it, <laughs> they would realize it's it would be way out of price range for everybody. It's an interesting world, the automotive world. It, it really is. is. It's and go ahead. No, you go ahead. Because I no, just you lost go ahead. My train you of really, thought. <laughs> you really see it when you go to SEMA because that is like the mecca of of projects, obviously. And so you see a dude that spends X amount of money on this, and it's like, why'd he build it this way? Like, you see some stuff that you can't even drive. That Forerunner that was outside, 
Oh Remember yeah, no, no drive shafts it or was, whatever it was. It was gigantic, and the thing was like, <laughs> it was like fifteen inch lift. You know, you couldn't drive it. It's like, why did they build this? Just go, just so it could go to could. a show. Yeah. You know, it's like for me, I'd like to build something so I could drive it and enjoy it. And yeah, like, I like that part at SEMA, the front area where the lifted trucks are. Yeah, and it's like nobody's gonna <laughs> drive. That. I never oh, understand yeah. the lifted trucks area because What's it's that, little like tiny tires. And yeah, they got these like low wheels, profile like tires, eight inch wheels, and like. It's like, how does that thing even drive? You couldn't even – I don't even think I could drive that across an open parking lot where and there was nothing. And they have all the, the billet, like, links that are all, like, cut out in the center. and They're anodized, and you're just like, this is – The attention to detail is staggering. I think that's, that's I'll give much, them that. That's it. That's, that's all thing, you though, got. That blows somebody's skirt up. Exactly. Somebody is about – doesn't blow well, my well, skirt I'm, up. I'm wearing pants, so I'd like to look at something I'm not going to lie. I would never buy one. I would never build one. I would never spend any but money. But look at them. I'll look at them. We are men from SoCal. And I guarantee you, some dude from Alabama or Kentucky goes to that, and they're like, "Holy!" Hey, don't piss them off. We crap. need them to yeah. listen. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What the Man, fuck? Jeez. Oh, geez. No, but, I was oh, g- somebody of a different area would come and see that, and they would just be blown away. Like, oh my god, how do I get this thing in my garage or my shed? Do you remember on the way there, right before we went shooting, uh, that Jeep, the Jeep that had, yeah. you know, when you order, I don't know if any of you have done this, but you order some parts that you know is like a Chinese manufactured kit. And it right. has what's that zinc, uh, that gold coating that's on a lot of those crappy Cre- steel parts. Uh, Cre- Cresil or what is that stuff called? I don't know. It's keeps like it zinc, from rusting it's like when it's zinc, on. The, the it keeps coating, it from rusting right? when it's on the boat coming over from China. This this guy had a, a, a jeep that was going to SEMA, and all the links were just it. They were so ineffective because it was like a it was like a Z, not a Z. It was like a uh, like if you look at one of the heart monitors, the EKGs or whatever, the up and down. Yeah. That's what the links look like. And it goes up and down, and it's all this, like, Chinese plate-cut, coated steel shit. And you're just like, what? You've taken all the effectiveness out of what you tried to do, because it still had huge tires on it. It still had right. Dana 44s. It was badass. But you, this little details that you've added because it looked cool in your mind has essentially rendered it useless. the purpose of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. It's just, well, it becomes a show car, right? It becomes a, it's just strictly a, a show vehicle. A staple for that company yeah. that I'm sure if somebody were to go into their shop, wherever it may be, they're like, oh, my God, what is this thing? And, you know, they're like, oh, some... we put this much money into this. And, and then you see it amongst all the other ones, and you're like, yeah, but that guy can actually go over, like, the whole yeah, king look of at the his, hammers Look course. at his two-inch Daystar lift. He gets <laughs> to go up, you know, waterfall <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Hey, yeah. man, I had a two-inch Daystar lift on my Jeep. That's my point. It was rad. That's who I'm talking about. But you man. can't say that, though, because then you'll lose customers. Yeah, yeah so it was cool. The Daystar lift was good. That was stage one, but we're at stage 40 now on the Jeep, so <laughs> I like it much better now. It is smoother. Next year, coilovers. Yeah. Coilovers. Mm. Yes. So what else what did is, I want? I want we, need to, we need to change your shock mounts in the rear because you're not. Oh, um, yeah. I'm bottoming those we're, out. We got to add a bump stops, I think, back there as well. That would Hydraulics. Be rad. Hydraulic so, bumps. In order, what is the first thing that you do in a in a restoration? I The first thing I do, once the car's been picked, you say? So say uh, the car is in the shop? No, or no, no, no. From starting out with it. Okay, so the first thing is go. find the right car. Do you, when you make that choice... Uh, would you committed. say that you need to take into account like uh, parts availability? Yeah. So, so what I'll do is depending on the build and the customer, and after the meeting I have with the customer, um, it goes. Uh, say it's a resto mod, right? So, I'm going to be less worried about numbers matching. I'm going to be less worried about if the car's got original equipment on it because I know in my brain it's getting wheelwood brakes, it's getting a crate motor, it's getting new um, Hotchkiss suspension. It's getting, you know, whatever, a Yukon gear and axle, rear. It's, yeah, it's getting yeah. vintage air. So and first I have to, you know, is it a resto mod? Yes. Is the guy going to let us do whatever we want with it? Yes. Okay. Then that will help me decide on what vehicle, because then I'll focus more on just the structure of the vehicle. Yeah. Is the body intact? Is the frame intact? Uh, that's the starting point that I worry about. If they do want to have a proper restoration, then i got to look even deeper into Okay, uh, is this the right engine for this car? Is this the right suspension that was in this car? Um, and then also start going into what you said, parts availability. If I'm missing something stupid as a grab handle um, up on the ceiling, can I get that grab handle? Yeah. Or can I not get that grab handle? Can I get that window crank? Or can even, you even get windows alone? Can you even get you know? windows, glass, you know? Um, my one, I got a guy I use in Vista who, who has got tons of glass, but... He's running out of stuff. You know, it's becoming harder to get. 
So then once you've done all of that research and you nail the car down, then it's basically at that point uh, a complete teardown. And a complete teardown has to be methodical. Everything in I really uh, like things to be labeled, bagged. All the bags have to be labeled. Like it's you're always saying, take pictures of this, take pictures of this. Take like, pictures. I, oh my I, gosh, I have a great pictures. brain. It's fine. Go I can buy remember. A camera. Dude, get oh, that, pictures, you know, man. It's, it's the truth. Pictures help so much. Whether it's like a sensor that there's two sensors. I don't know how old we're going back here, but. It really helps. You'll, go, you'll look at something and you'll be like, oh, how could I ever forget this? And then six months later, you're like, I Jesus, this. I don't even remember. Was... Does this bracket even from this car? Yeah. <laughs> like, where, yeah. where was this ever on this car? Mm-hmm. So I've learned over the years, everything gets in a Ziploc bag. Everything gets labeled. Even if it's a bolt that I'm never going to use again, it goes in the bag so that when it comes time to replace the bolt, I, can I know it, what you know. bolt I need to get. Yep. Right? So everything goes in the bag. Don't throw anything away. And, I mean, literally, don't throw anything away everything goes in bags and gets labeled and put on a shelf you know what i think is another smart thing to do i mean obviously buy a camera if you don't have one buy one yeah you know keep it all on one or two memory cards speaking of memory cards are we are we recording we're good no we're fine okay cool. <laughs> um wow you had to bring that up man. Yeah, it actually is good because i've like you know if you put it on your phone and this is not saying there's anything wrong with using your phone but i have like three thousand pictures on my phone and like for one project that you're not working on every single day, it, it gets, gets separated. It gets and then well, because nobody's there. diligent enough at the end of the day to take all those photos and drop them into a album. specific album, yeah. right? Put them into the cloud. <laughs> or if whatever. you're that guy, then go for it. But otherwise, have a dedicated card for That's it. Yeah. Literally, my job here. Is yeah. what? That's all I do is take photos and drop them into dedicated libraries right. and sort them and make sure that but the you're cards. A special are, breed. Yeah, it's your, you, <laughs> you're you a special breed. For that. But Thanks. I think I think another thing that's really important too that kind of goes unspoken for is know your nuts and bolts. Like get one of those little the little gauges that you can check what size it is, what thread that's true. is. Because as stupid as it sounds, like some things like on newer ish Chevys, a lot of stuff is standard, a lot of stuff is metric. Well, yeah, the whole engine's metric. You know what I mean? So it's like there's way different things. So if you're trying to put a you know you run into an issue where you're trying to put a standard bolt into the engine and all of a sudden you strip it out and guess what? Now you just created yourself another two hours of work for something that could have been. Yeah. Avoided. You got to know your shit. You got to know so, what you're dealing with. So not to say that everyone's dumb and can't do that, but it's, it's, it's a nice tool to have, have in the toolbox. And as stupid as it sounds, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it totally does. And when you go to buy a bunch of parts, like you said, you put that little one bolt that you're probably never going to use again, but you put it in that bag. Well, guess what? Now, when you go back, you go, all right, cool. I need an M six by, 25 that's you know that's metric for everybody out there because jake's a miata guy now yeah sorry i'm a miata guy yeah but what's the thread pitch oh man good old metric is it one 1. 1. 1. 1.5 but that's with everything one time know? i took apart a twin carb setup off a cb 400 honda from the early 80s and smashed it with i'll a really never do that again <laughs> the worst is when you're taking something apart and you don't know that it's spring loaded. Oh, and yeah. And you pull something off, and a bearing, a, like a little ball, and a spring goes bing, flying out. And you're like, wait, wait what came out of there? <laughs> that I'll, maybe I'll, was probably my most extensive restoration project was that carburetor. And we ran into literally everything. This is what actually my, my, my brother-in-law told me when I started wanting to work on cars and learning and stuff. He goes, go buy something with a small engine, probably a motorcycle, mm-hmm. and – go through the entire thing and build it back up into basically something brand new like figure out how valves work figure out how carburetors work why they work all the pieces boots gaskets diaphragms springs linkages like the whole thing look at everything because if you can do it on a small motor and it totally helped next thing you know like jake and i are on his old uh his uh what was it the uh the Falcon Ranchero. Ranchero? Oh, the Ranchero. The Ranchero. Oh, yeah. And, like, I, that was, like, the second thing that I did that was really involved with him. And we're talking about uh, points and distributors yeah. and all this other stuff and how it works. And you're just like, all right, well. And I literally learned all of that from taking an 81 CB400 from basically a bin and putting it all back together with Jake. And we seriously were in the shop every night until – one one thirty in the yeah. morning we had a huge yep. whiteboard that we hung at that just had like 60 <laughs> things on it that we just like you would do something you'd look back up on the board 
And you'd be like, okay. That's well, not even on there. What can I do next? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, then you did something that wasn't even on there, and you're like, I can't believe. Then you <laughs> write it on there, and then you cross it out. And no, literally just for just for the like the thing inside of you as a guy that's just like, I like to put things on a list and then cross them off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I crossed it off. It takes, Martin, Martin said something yesterday I liked, which is know the machine, right? Yep. And, and that's the thing, right? The more you work on these things, the more you understand the machine. And every time you work on a carburetor now, you, you understand the machine. If yeah. you understand how an engine works, Jake's restoring, uh, uh, doing an engine build uh, just to, to basically get more familiar with building an engine from the ground up, from a bare block up. And he's going to know the machine. I mean, he knows the theory of the machine, right? We all know internal combustion. We know the theory of the machine. But until you're hands-on building the machine, then you really know the machine. You see yeah. every passageway, where it goes, where it came from. Right. The tension of the springs, how the valves seat, like the whole nine yards. I mean, I'll take a car part back in the day, and, and I, I would spend, you know, an hour staring at how the stupid uh, heater control selector works. Oh, I know. You're like, what the you're like, what the hell do? is this thing? This is vacuum controlled. There's... What? And you start looking at, okay, this hose goes here and then out of here. And if I do this switch, it opens a little hole here and then vacuum goes into this hole. But why can and then I this hear door the vacuum opens. when the car is off? I don't <laughs> understand. So it's just funny, you know, you just you start getting really deep into some of these cars. And it's like, man, who was the engineer who dreamt this up? Oh, I know. That was, that was my first day I think I worked here was the Blazer was in here. Yeah. And you go, all right, we got all these parts. You got to put the dash together. And I was sitting here like. Okay, oh, and you God. give me a little vacuum, <laughs> a little like vacuum, like hand trigger vacuum thing, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, okay, that does this, and then you go, <laughs> oh, that does this, and I literally probably sat there for like 30 minutes just going, oh, cool, that door open, you know, yeah, like that door and now open. hook it up oh, so they all goes work. To the, that's, this one goes to the this one goes to the floor, like that's for the you know the foot heater, and then you hook that one up, you're like, okay, sweet, what's the next one? You know, you're on the hunt now. It's like, all right, wait. Now, how does this go together? I don't know what this is. Like, mm, well, and it you were, like it goes there. And you were in a worse position because you didn't disassemble that car. No, I didn't. Disassemble you came a in part of it, totally never late. Touch a K five, anything. Yeah. And it was like, oh no, how does this? go? And me being me, I'm like, yeah, 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 man, make all that yeah, stuff yeah, work. Go ahead. You'll be go fine. Ahead. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> hey, trial by fire, right? I mean, you're gonna learn. You're gonna learn. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and yeah. for me, when new guys come in the shop, it's like, do that. And if I can walk away, and within an hour, you've got it all figured out. Well, you're the guy I want around the shop. I need people who can Learning. figure shit out. I don't need people who, you know, can't you know, figure things out. Hours, don't worry about, you know, I'm I mean, I'm not there. against questions. I like people to ask questions because that's how you learn. But I also like people who know how to have some sort of critical thinking and it's figure something out. It's the ability to try, I think, is what yeah. it is. It's just you have to be able to try it and try to figure it out and, you know, get as far as you can. Some people will just, like, stop, say, I've never dealt with that before. How do I do this? We'll give it a little bit of time, you know, look at it, determine how it works, and then go from there. If you can't do it, I'll help you out. But Right. I don't know. There's a – I feel like there's a certain type of mindset that you have to be in to properly restore something, um, and especially the people that you work with have to be in that same mindset. If you're not all on the same page of we're going to do it all, like, literally down to the last O-ring, right. then, then – you know, and you can take pride in that. One of my like my favorite restoration is the Group B Celica restoration because it's a rusted out POS. Jesus Christ, it never ends. And no, it doesn't because and it's literally rally. Enca- encapsulates <laughs> everything amazing. It is badass. No, that the, the level badass. of those dudes, those finished dudes, are wild. Well, think about this: to to restore a car is a is a pain in the ass. It is a work to document picture and write up every single bit bolt corner <laughs> today bend we removed this done. bolt exactly <laughs> you just like quadrupled the amount of you're writing a book and doing the project right like, that's stupid yeah that's good <laughs> that 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 but, that but that's pretty stupid. awesome <clears throat> go on though yeah, Sorry. that's pretty that's why people detail-oriented. pay people like me to do that Although then I always kind of get halfway in and halfway out where I'm like, this sucks. Ooh, I want to cut that up or like, I want to weld that. And I'm like, oh, I got to take a photo or like, I don't know. I'm like trying to think of what's going on. And I'm like, I, I need my hands on that. So I like understand what's going on and, and what, what this is. We did the cut and turn on that guy's uh, SAS uh, Forerunner. And I like, I had to get my hands on it. And I and then people are going cut and turn forerunner. What's an what? SAS, huh? Oh, solid. That, that's some special solid axle swap. This the Russian says is awesome. the assassins. No, the yeah, solid axle swap. And then 
And then day two, uh, you know, Ruski got to do most of it, which was. It's because you didn't show up, dude. This is why our Instagram and <laughs> Facebook and all our social media sucks, is because our we'll come into work and be like, okay, man, we're going to take 10 pictures today of the work we do today. And then the day's over, and we're because we just get into it and we do it. And we get all the work done. And it's like, do we take any pictures of what we just did? No. Oh. It is so hard to take your phone out and take a picture. As stupid as well, that sounds. Well, especially for it me, really is. Like for me, I'm old school guy, right? Like I don't, I don't know. You yeah. know, I don't think about it. I just want to get the job done. You know, but we we need to. You know, we're getting we're getting better at it. Everybody, we'll start yeah. getting more stuff up there. We are. No, we're gonna have a cut and turn with article my, up soon. It'll with my great. whole detailing thing, I I'm like. I need to take pictures of this before and after. Like, that's almost like the best result, you know? Yeah. Like, when you see the before and after. And then, sure enough, I get done with it. I'm like, yeah, that looks sick. And I'm like, oh, right. I forgot to take a picture. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> nobody's going to understand yeah, how bad it looks. Nobody's going to know. Yeah. But, Any uh, other uh, uh, personal projects you guys have done that uh, in, in jet the – Jet skis. In the, yeah, jet skis. That's right. You, you've uh, so, Those you've done proper restorations. Can, those I, are full. I, can I add one thing, though? Go ahead. Uh, just before we go to jet skis, is how much carburet or EFI is taken for granted. Oh, <laughs> it's, I don't, it is I don't modern at all. fuel injection. I do not take it for granted. Right? At all. I mean, if you've ever driven to the mountains, if you've ever not driven your car for a month, if you've ever started your lawnmower like uh, uh, two months after you mowed your lawn last and it didn't start. If you've ever walked into your garage in the morning and not passed out from vapor. Yeah, if you've ever yeah. turned your car on and driven it five seconds later, you probably... You owe EFI. You've never owned you, it. Yeah. All you bastards out there, you guys owe <laughs> EFI. Pay your respects. Yeah, you know. So yeah, it is pretty horrible. rad, dude. I, I, I used to rebuild carburetors all the time for people, and I despised it. I think rebuilding is not too bad. People are afraid of carburetors. Oh, yeah, rebuilding yeah. them, not too bad. Tuning them... Freaking nightmare, especially yeah, back tune in the my, day. Tune my Spitfire. Oh my god, dude. DCO, oh. DCOE forty Weber's dual side draft Weber's. Yeah, when you don't just awesome. have a fuel air screw and an idle, and you're like, no, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, there's more than idle one. Is like a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. But when they're running right, oh man. It is, oh, it's it pretty sweet. Wow. What, what, what's those carburetors you were talking about back in the was the 1830s, 1840s? I don't know. But the ones that just... Uh, I'm not that old. <laughs> you were saying they just pretty much dump fuel into it? Like predator. Predator carbs? It looked like... I'm not kidding you. It looked like this... this uh, you're, Like a, a J-box. Like a contractor's J-box, right? Like yeah. a, a, just a, literally a square tin box that went on top of your intake manifold. And it just basically was like this flap door that you'd hit the gas pedal and just pour fuel in. <laughs> it was rad. It sounds dope. Who needs to atomize? There was like no burning. adjustment. It was just like pour fuel in. Yes, <laughs> cars fast now. You don't need an accelerator. It is, it is the chalk. You had to no drive it like a two-stroke. You had you were either off the gas or you were full throttle. <laughs> yes, I want one of these. There, yes. no, there was no idle circuit. There was no. No, it just bop. <laughs> that fast. sounds like my kind of car. Yeah, it was. They were cool. Right, but the uh, so the jet ski thing. That's something that's kind of interesting because we have like seven of them out there, and they're all out at our uh, our Havasu house, and so we. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, you know, oh. that's where we keep the Can Ams <laughs> too. Let's see, oh, yeah. God, I have a Maverick you have X3. seven jet skis, Biffy. and I have zero. Okay, <laughs> think of it this way though: they are investments because pretty much six out of seven of those are worth like quadruple of what we bought them for, which mm. is cool. In my opinion. Well, so are you going to sell one to your buddy then? No. <laughs> no, he oh, actually not. will sell them to somebody else for very cheap before he sells them to you. Trust you're, me, I've experienced it. You're yeah. such a <laughs> jerk. So going back to that, so we we ride those things pretty damn hard. I mean, it's kind of hard not to. They're two-stroke. They're 550 or 650 cc's, and you're on the water, and you're just freaking pinning it, you know? And so when they break, it's like you take them home. Somehow you get them back to the – back to the dock and load them up in the truck and take them home and then you get them on the cart and you're looking at them like doing all the diagnostics you know is it getting fuel is it getting spark is it getting this and sometimes the weekend runs out and you're like well gotta go home you know and then you come down a couple weeks later you go back out there and all of a sudden it's like oh dude why didn't we check this yeah that's the problem okay cool get that done you know yep. so it's just it's a whole different thing if it were to be in the shop like here where I work and I can work on it all like after work or whatever it's probably a different story but you're you get out there on a friday you work on stuff you get it ready for saturday on like you get it ready all friday night for saturday 
you ride all day Saturday, something's probably going to break because it's a 1980s watercraft. And then Sunday, it's like the fixing day. <laughs> you know, right yeah. before you leave, you figure out if you need to get parts. And then next weekend, you go out there. It's like clockwork. Yeah. But I have one right now that I'm doing a kind of like a homage to the old racing ski. So I did a full on restoration. It all started with a blown motor, which I probably could have replaced a piston and been back on the water. But it was like, no. I'm going to put a new gel coat on the bottom. So I took the hole to my dad's house. He laid on a nice fresh gel coat. We wet sanded it all down. It's like butter smooth. Put brand new rebuilt pump in it. Like, How long have you been working on this? Oh, a couple years now. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And I just, it's I just jet want, skis are small, right? It's turned into. It's a motor it's, and, and a box. Right. Okay. So two years. Got the it. funny thing with that, though, is like <laughs> it sits there. And when I go out there, it's like I don't want to work on that because we have other running skis that I, that I ride around. Not so a priority. Like, yeah, it's not a priority because there's other stuff. If that was my he, only ski. He walks and, into his garage and have a soon goes, look at all these jet skis and Can-Am Mavericks and things rat. that go-karts that I can play with. Or I could restore that piece of shit. And then nah. I go, nah. Can-Am. And then go <laughs> <laughs> and he, but he won't sell the other pieces of shit to his buddies for a dealio. So, you're, but such, you're so wack. It is cool because I went on keeps got, eBay. Keeps on talking. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, eBay. You know what? I think, I think Jake and I are going to put an end to this. He's you're never right. even invited us to go to Havasu with him. For yeah. real, bro. Let's go. Oh, oh now it's Okay. Yeah, now, sure. I don't want to go now. Now you no. don't even mean me it. Either. Yeah. I got yeah. something to do this you weekend. Yeah, super it. busy. I got <laughs> coins to count. <laughs> me super too. Busy. I, uh, I'm going to go find a girlfriend. Yeah, I got... I'll be busy. <laughs> I'm growing. I'm growing peppers. I need to tender to them. But no, I, I don't know. For some reason, we got into the vintage watercrafts uh, in the last couple of years, and it's. Gone I think it's because your dad. Your dad was always into my watercraft. Dad, hey, yeah, don't inter- don't interrupt me. Your dad was. <laughs> my dad. Go ahead. My dad. No, he's my fine. dad. <laughs> I hate your dad. <laughs> But no, my dad was into him when he was in high school, and my mom rode, and it was, you know, that was the thing to do back in the day. Was yeah, like, she did. Who wants to go jet skiing on my stand up? And and so I don't know. I was why. never good at it. I always had to stay on my knees. Yeah, you know, I can never it stand up. It happens. It is. It it's because you're a tall guy. Workout. I'm not leverage. small, that's for sure. So, yeah, watch Dave's a big triumph. guy. That he's a big guy. <laughs> I, realistically, I want so bad to restore the 87 CR125 that's been in my garage for like two years, but it's not mine. It's somebody else's. Oh, we'll buy it off. Him. And the guy, well, yeah, I really want to, but the guy, like, sometimes he asks about it, and I'm like, yeah, dude, you can literally come pick it up whenever. And then he just never comes and picks it up. And I'm like, do you want this bike or not, man? Because I'm about to start polishing the rims and, like, buying plastics. And it's such a rad bike. It's so much fun. It's so light and small. He keeps so asking. <laughs> just tell the guy. Like, hey, just it? tell the guy. Sure, go, hey man, I, I I need some room in the garage. I gotta. Your bike's gonna be out front, and it's gonna start getting wrecked by the rain, or maybe even get stolen. So you better come, you know, snatch that baby up. Right. I'm and actually, then he'll then he'll either go, oh shoot, and he'll run over and grab it, and it'll be out of your life, and you won't have to dr- you know stress about it. Yeah. Or he'll go, oh yeah, that's a lot of work. Did you said you wanted it, right? That's right. That's you got to bring it up to – we got to just stop by the cow shed, get a burger, and be like, so how much for the bike? Because I guess it's got a brand-new top end. Brand, another story. Sorry. It rips. <clears throat> it it uh, needs, just needs a carb rebuild. It needs, what's it, it worth? Needs, for uh, 87 CR? Yeah, prob- oh, it's, it's probably like one? eight. Oh, wait. It, it, run and drive right this now. This one? This one right now? Yeah. It's worth like 400 bucks. Three to 500, yeah. Go into wherever he's at, throw two hundy down on the table, and go, that bike's mine. I like it. It's actually a pretty good way to do it. People people respond to cash. Right. Just cash, go, where money, does he mother- have the title? Go, hey, I'll be back tomorrow for the title. That bike's mine. And just walk out. I like that. That's strong. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not. You're really I'll video tall. it. And that then, probably works for you because you're really tall. But you have a no, if I wanted the you bike, I'd just walk in there and look at him and go, that bike's mine. I'll be <laughs> no, back tomorrow for the title. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That guy took like a turn at forty miles an hour in a gas golf cart when we on like a really bad hill in Lake San Marcos, and I was oh, no. very nervous. Hey, we, no we for though? sure you t- pulled it off. Oh, we pulled it off. Oh, it, rad. it. They it take, was rad. They take those. Here's the other thing. They take the CR125 motor, and that's what they make. There's a whole like shifter cart following that uses yes. that motor. And well, isn't it the F125 series? Right, so. the shifter cart they call it F125 because it's got the 125cc motor in it. Right? And I'm not gonna lie, they're shifter really carts fast. I'm are... talking out of my ass right now. I have no idea if well, that's what. No, it is. what? But... Dang it, David, you can't do that. <laughs> you are the... fact checked it for you sure. You are the elder. We... Fact check it, Jake. 
Hey, how come look I get yelled at for dumb shit? And then, well, I guess you did yell at That's Somebody else has to look it up. Look up F-125. One thing I wanted to do is put a jet ski motor on a golf cart. Dude. Or not on a golf cart, on a go-kart. Have you seen the high? Hey, James. Have you seen the Hayabusa jet ski? Yes. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. That thing is gnarly. It's all black, right? Isn't that a Mark Queen thing? Isn't, I'm not going to uh, go there. Mark, I'm, I'm is not, it Queen? I, I'm and not. Havasu. Or, or where is he at? He's over in Arizona. Mark Queen. Can you, yeah. teach, me ther- <laughs> can you teach me thermal chemistry? Sure. Yeah, no. Okay, You can? No. All right, well, you're going to have to now. Why? Because I'm missing class. Oh. That's why I asked for 430. Gotcha. No, but seriously, can we please can we please restore a TR six? So, yeah, you want a TR six, so right? What project are you on, Jake? What, have you <clears throat> have you taken a turbo any account? T- turbo two point three, my man. And what are you gonna put? But no, for real though, look at this. The Triumph TR six is badass. Look at that. Yeah, that's that's very cool. I'm a big fan Yo, of those. Isn't that badass? That's the TR six. It's cooler than a Spitfire. That is dope. It's cooler than a Spitfire. So I think hey, those hey, check cool. this out. Little, if you say that again, little. I'm going to punch you in the mouth. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing I got. Well, I guess not. Okay. Well, sorry. Smack those ceramic teeth right out You're of your mouth. You're the one who brought this up. You no, know. I know. I really like those two, actually. So you have you have a Ford 2.3 liter that you're going to turbo. You're building that motor right now, which at this moment, in my opinion, it seems like you're just doing it for the shit of it. Because I don't have a vehicle to put it in? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But that's what tomorrow's for. What are you doing tomorrow? Going to look for a ranger. Oh. So you're not coming in? Uh, I'll be in in the morning, and then I'll leave after that. No, oh, so the so Ford Pinto. Everybody always banging on the Pinto. You know, the gas tank's in the back. It's going to blow up if you rear end it. Congratulations. The gas tank's in the back of every other car on the face of the planet. No, dude. We, uh, we, I was part of a team that raced Pintos at El Cajon Speedway back in the day. Pony stock class. They were rad. They're awesome. Forged low for forged crank, forged rods. The pistons were garbage, but you know you can swap those out. But they came turboed from the factory in the XR4 Ti, the Mercury, the Merker or whatever. Oh, the Merker, the Merker. You had the the, uh, the Thunder Chicken, the Turbo Coupe. You had the SVO, the Mustang SVO, and a lot of these were around like 200 horsepower or whatever. And they're not bad, but everything was forged already, so you just pump a little bit more boost in it, get that sweet uh, manual Gillis valve, I think is what it was called. People are making 350, 400 horsepower out of a 2.3 liter four cylinder. You know, this was single the overhead over- cam. Oh like, yeah, that was badass. Which is funny because that's what we go back. That's what we went back to before. Was there's always room for improvement. There's the way that a company did it back in 1984 was way different than what you want to do to it now. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's new technology that you can go put a brand new GT35 Garrett, you know, on that old motor and make ridiculous power, but. Yeah. Yeah. For them back in the day, they had this like old school whatever. I know you're you know, stealing like, Volvo turbos yeah, and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> oh, so, Volvo it's six psi. Below. It's rad. A lot of people run like you know six eight psi on some cars, and they're like, "This is a lot of power." Well, I think the stock, the manual SVOs, uh, topped out at eighteen psi, like with no modifications. You're just like, Jesus Christ! It doesn't even have ARP head studs. <laughs> what are you gonna do? What oh are you my gonna God. do? So to get back to the restorations a little bit, we started on the uh, Willys project oh, yeah i don't know how we in, didn't include that how did we not time. talk about this so gonna bring it's it right up, there gonna so we it. have the 59 willie's wagon that had no drivetrain but it was a nice body and frame and we don't like the frame because the frame is the c channel piece of crap from 1959 so we found the donor car the 1973 fj55 land cruiser so we got the body off the land cruiser and we whittled the uh firewall down because we're trying to keep as much of the land cruiser firewall as we can to incorporate the pedals and the steering uh, makes it a little easier. Uh, and the firewall and floor pan of the Willys is completely rusted out, so no problem cutting that all out and then grafting the uh, F or the uh, FJ uh, parts to the Willys at that point. So we got it to the point where we've got uh, the Willys body kind of sitting on top, and now we're running into all of our things that we're going to have to deal with, like the uh, it's too long in the back by about a foot, so we're going to chop the whole, like a whole foot off the back of the Land Cruiser, which is fine because those cars kind of, those, those FJs kind of were hard. really long they're in the back. Heavy. They were tail heavy. So we'll just chop that off. Or if we want to keep the tow hitch receiver and everything, we can just section 
section like 12 inches out of the frame. Sectioning it, I think, is going to be the way to go. Yeah, I think that'll be the solution that toe, for that. It's freaking toe hitch. Everybody yeah. needs a toe hitch. Can we already take the toe hitch off? No, it's, no, it's still on there. Oh. So then the front, uh, now we remember this Willys came with a flathead four-cylinder in it and is a very narrow engine compartment, in all honesty, which is why we didn't put a V8 or anything in it. I know people put small block Chevys in there, but we're, we're sticking with the inline six, the F series engine that came, uh, on the Land Cruiser, but it's got two extra cylinders. Uh, so we're going to have to modify the grill and have some interesting situations trying to get the, uh, uh, a radiator in there. Ah, oh, man. Cause it is, you a, got like a, like the, a one by two box that you got. <laughs> like, it's not a big space. No, the FJ 55 is so square. It is very square. The front of the Willys is doved. It's like a pear shape. If you yeah. look at it from above, it's narrow with the front, wide at the back. Yeah, it's and it looks big beautiful. Booty. It's fantastic, but it just definitely doesn't really agree with anything that isn't right. a 59 Willys. Right. It's going to be interesting to how it lays on there and where the grill ends up because to center the rear axle of the FJ with the rear fender of the uh, – the wheelies and then where the front tire ends up and then the front spring hanger on the FJ is like going to be a foot in front of the stock grill. <laughs> so you have the grill and then a foot in front of it, you'll have the, the, the leaf spring hanger. So I think we're going to do something funny where we add a winch and a nice built bumper or something on the front. So it kind of looks purposeful so that it doesn't look weird that the grill is now a foot behind an or an underbite. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So we're going to have to do some funny business there, but but it's cool to get going on that project finally. It already and, looks pretty mean sitting up there. Yeah, I was stuffed on. I mean, we literally took the body and kind of dropped it on, cut the floor out and dropped it on there and went, eh, it's close. It's, we got to, you know, we're getting some jobs in the shop. We had a few days uh, where we didn't have a lot of jobs, so we pulled it down and started on it. But now it's back up on the lift in the corner out of the way. Um, we'll throw a picture up on Instagram so everybody can see. The monstrosity uh, as it sits right now. It's awesome. That's yeah, we'll do, maybe we'll sit down and talk and talk more about it, and we can throw some stuff together. Yeah, we'll have we'll have some more articles on the website. Um, uh, don't forget to go to our website a lot. Um, we're always putting up photos, video libraries. And, We've got great stuff up yeah. there. It's not a chore, people. Yeah, it's super cool. There's go tons of cool out. content. <laughs> like I mean, if you you're on CNN in the morning, like no, don't do That's that. That's why I wanted comedy on that website. Yeah. Is news I mean, if you're listening to our <laughs> podcast, you'll definitely be interested in the stuff that's on the uh, website as far as the content. Um, Just stories, pictures. I don't know. James is a pretty good writer, even though he's hyping himself up. I will go on his side I here do? and say, James, I'm sorry. Yeah, James is like pretty You rad. just said, like, there's a lot of good stuff on the website. Though. You're all the stuff that you're in charge of all you, the stuff on the website. what you do, you fuck. Oh, wait. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's oh, it. That that's he does a great job. So, you know. Well, we're going to have, uh, once Jake gets a little bit further into this, we're going to have how to build yourself a four-cylinder turbo beast. Yeah. We're going to have Ruski, probably a follow-up pretty soon on the LS. Once... Uh, hopefully we have a good video. Yeah. Oh, because... we already have some of a video. Yeah. We've been at a standstill, nothing necessarily too exciting yeah, happening, no. so we'll have like, that why soon. Why not? Well, here's here's one thing is i got to build header soon, so maybe we do a little video tutorial on how to do your first ever header build. No, that'd be great. We're going to do think that. That's something that people would I like, like it. To do. And then heads up to everybody out there. I'm selling a pair of BMWs. You can build yourself one really neat BMW or have two, you know, kind of okay BMWs. <laughs> right. So hit me up because once you do that, I can start building my rally car. And uh, once I do that, my, all my dreams will be fulfilled and I can finally die. So please set me free. <laughs> just go to bentmotorsports.com. there's going to be a GoFundMe account for James. Yeah. <laughs> just go to bentmotorsports.com and hit the contact us. And uh, there's plenty of ways to get a hold of us. If you want to talk to James or any of these guys, feel free to do that. Uh, I think we got a wrap. Jake's late for school. I'm totally not going to make it. It's 20 <laughs> minutes till I have class. So. Oh, no. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. I'm not even going to go. Wow, you've got 20 minutes to get to class, and you're like, eh, forget it. It's an hour and 20-minute class, and I'm already 10 minutes in there, so it's going to miss so. 30 minutes you of go the class, class, not know what the fuck is going on. Me so either. at least yeah. the podcast is already done now, so the school cut out. Fools. But <laughs> School's for school. All right, later. Podcast. Thanks for listening in. Be sure to give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, at Bent Motorsports. Stay updated on the latest happenings, future projects, videos, and events here at the shop. Remember, guys, Bent Motorsports, bits in stock, we've got it.